So you sometimes still hear CEOs refer to their companies as families, but they don't really mean it. This is an old photo of my family. I'm in the bow tie. And it would be unthinkable for my dad to sit me down as a kid and say, we're sorry, Ben, there's no longer a place for you in the Kaznokas. <laughs> Your table setting skills are doing nothing to deliver the kind of exceptional customer performance we're looking for. And your fascination with the San Francisco Giants does nothing for our bottom line. We're going to have to let you go, but don't take it personally. It's just family. <laughs> so trust is gone, loyalty is gone, you get some flexibility, but you don't get much in the way of innovation. The one-day contract doesn't actually lead to the kind of adaptable, entrepreneurial workforce that we want to cultivate to reach new heights of innovation. And imagine if you could recruit the same kind of world-class people who work at Google. What if you could manage and cultivate an entrepreneurial energy in all of your people like is done at, at a Tesla? What would it mean to your business if you could retain the best entrepreneurial minds in the world at your company? Well, to do those things, we believe you need to have an alliance framework. And within an alliance framework, you want to choreograph the progressive levels of commitment in the employer-employee relationship using a framework that we call tours of duty. Reed and I really believe that there's going to be a new pact, a new compact that defines the relationship between employer and employee. Because the old compact, this idea that an employee shows up to work totally untrained, totally unentrepreneurial, and pledges lifelong loyalty to your company in exchange for being trained and being told what to do and for utter job security, that relationship is disintegrated. And what's replaced it is a new compact that's based on alliance more than loyalty. It's an alliance that acknowledges that the creative adaptive superstars that you want to hire in your company are going to have certain entrepreneurial inclinations that need to be cultivated, that need to be embraced, that need to be channeled to benefit your company. All right, if these people exhibit some of the same awesome entrepreneurial tendencies that my tech friends and I exhibit, shouldn't they be under this umbrella of entrepreneur too? Maybe entrepreneurship is more of a life idea than a business one. Maybe it's more of a a way of looking at the world than it is a discrete description of someone who starts themselves a new business. So, you know, we've all heard speakers that are kind of all charisma, but no real content. And I try to bridge those two worlds by both, you know, inspiring an audience, trying to share some from my own personal journey and talk about why I'm optimistic about the future, but also share some real practical, specific, substantive ideas about how we can improve ourselves, improve our companies, and ultimately improve the world at large. We remember Jeff Bezos and Steve Jobs, but we, we forget about all the allies and lieutenants and networks they built up around them. And in fact, entrepreneurs are killer networkers. They're amazing at building networks of people who can support the work they do. What is the mistake that most people make when they take risk? I think uh, most people have a sense that risk is something you can avoid. In mm -hmm. fact, you can't avoid risk. Uh, every breakout career opportunity has risk. And so the real question is, how do you manage risk? How There's do you no take guarantee. There's no guarantee. And I think if you look at, we profile a number of, uh, of people in the book uh, who have led these kind of adaptive entrepreneurial careers, like Sheryl Sandberg, for example, who started uh, volunteering in India, helping the poor, and then was a management consultant, and then uh, was at the World Bank, and then pivoted into the technology industry. And over the course of her career, took many intelligent risks and, and sought out those opportunities that, that had some risk but also had tremendous upside. I'm not a full-time speaker. And the reason I'm not a full-time speaker is I think it's really important to live in the world, to work at an office, to experience the things that most people experience on a day-to-day -day basis. So that when you do show up to make a presentation and give a speech, you can speak in a way that resonates with people who live in the real world. Whether I'm speaking to 3,000 people in a huge convention center or to a group of four 
you know, uninspired college students, the goal is the same. If you can change the life of even one person, that has ripple effect that can change the world. You know, for entrepreneurs, impact is the drug of choice. And that's why if I can have an impact on even one person, that provides the ultimate satisfaction. It's why I do what I do.